Goodness. All right. Welcome to week 11. Uh, we're going to be continuing with SQL because that's pretty much what we're doing for the rest of the term. Um, we are going to be focusing today on aggregate functions. So as I was saying, we're going to be focusing on aggregate functions. Aggregate functions is the math part of SQL. Um, the most important part of data is always extracting value from the data. Unlike extracting no value from coming late. Um, so you extract value from the data by summarizing the information, determining patterns. Uh, there's an entire field dedicated to determining patterns from data. Um, and actual fact in your, this might be one of your electives, but I think you guys have a choice to take a, a business intelligence um, course. And that's essentially learning how to derive information from data. Uh, using a computer. Um, aggregate functions are functions that SQL provides to you to allow you to summarize the data before it ever leaves the server. Um, you'll notice I haven't gone off the first slide yet because this first, the very first slide of content actually has functions on it. Um, the database, database servers, regardless of how good or bad they are, are all excellent at summarizing data. That is literally what they're made for. Stuff that if you wanted to write code in Java could take a hundred lines you can do with a single function call in SQL. And some of these actually would be more than 100 lines of code, especially if you're trying to do multiple aggregates at once. And my thingy is Not working today. Amazing. Come on. Okay. Turn it off. Turn it on. There's always something. Okay, I guess we're not using this thing today. Apparently my audio is on. Okay, so in SQL, there are many, many aggregate functions. However, there's specific ones that are used the most. Uh, the top one that almost is used by absolutely everybody is count. And count is a little, has a few different ways of being used, uh, but essentially it allows you to count the rows of a table and or count the values that are not null. Uh, so if you do a count asterisk, it'll count the rows. If you count, and you give it a field name of some sort, then it will count wherever the column is not null. So it'll just tell you there's there's a thousand rows, 250 of them are null, so it'll return 750. Uh, it has a bit of built-in logic for that. Uh, sum, it just adds up all the value, numeric values in a column. Uh, average, min, and max. You guys know what averages are. Min and max are self-explanatory. Move faster. Min and max are used to figure out the minimum value and the maximum values. The functions are pretty clear and self-explanatory. Um, so the functions will either operate on a single row or record. Um, so when we think about normal functions, you'd think about um, string functions or date functions, you know, upper, lower, uh, date converts or date comparisons, casting. Those operate on a single row record. Aggregate functions operate on multiple rows of data. 
and they usually return a single value. Here's an example of a sum operation. Um, I'm actually going to go and do a few examples for you guys instead of going through all of these because I'd rather demonstrate than just read the slides. So if I go, and this is the same tables I was using last week. If I look at order lines, you'll notice that there's cost, quantity, and total. I could go select the sum of total from order lines and it gives me total. Um, I could ask it for the average total. It'll look at, it'll do literally what an average, how you'd calculate an average on in the real world. It adds up all the values, divides it by the number of rows for you, excluding nulls. Um, you got min, which is the lowest, and the max which is the biggest. Now, what one cool thing, remember earlier I said, you know, some of this stuff could be 100 rows of JavaScript. So, I mean, of Java, not JavaScript, of Java. So with Java, you want to figure out the max of a given order line. You would have to connect to the database, prepare the query, execute the query, make sure it ran correctly, loop through all the results, and then you're doing literally a, a sort and going, oh, is this total bigger than the total I know about? Yes, no. If it is, assign the currently known biggest total to that and continue to loop until you've done every single record. Or you could just ask the database server to do it for you and it just returns it as a single value. And again, this is where the alias comes in handy. Because um, then I can give it a nice name that comes out. And then, you know, your code would, whatever language you're using to access the database has a way to actually access this information. The other cool thing about aggregate functions is you can run multiple at once. And go, and I got a mistake here. Function name. Min. There we go. It was picky about the space. As you can see, I just ran five separate aggregate functions all at the same time. And it ran the exact same amount of time as it would have been if I did a single one. In Java, if you wanted to do this, you'd have to write code to handle the, the maximum value, the smallest value. If you were doing the average, you'd be summing up all the values. You'd also be counting all the rows. Um, you know, use the database what it's good for. So these are the common aggregate functions. Uh, other database servers, like these are the ones you'll find in all database servers. Um, Postgres, for example, has functions for uh, doing medians, uh, standard. Um, uh, deviants, uh, a bunch of different statistics, um, aggregate functions, which are cool. Now, I am going to show one special thing about the count. So if I go select uh, count city from customers, 500 cities because I have 500 rows in that table. There are 500 different, there are 500 entries of city. Remember last week and I talked about the distinct keyword where it operates on the entire unique value of the row. If you do count the distinct city, 276. And what it's doing is it's saying, I can see 276 unique values for city. Um, this one is actually going to be really handy for you guys in the uh, lab for aggregates, which is lab eight, if I remember right. Because um, there's a few spots where it talks about counting certain values. And 
learning to count distinct values is really important. So what the distinct key, what's kind of nifty is we can actually go count uh, distinct, um, I think that I call it the columns, uh, region. So I've got 276 unique cities and 52 unique regions in my database. A useful piece of information, uh, not useful to anything right now, but it's showing you how you can fairly easily uh, use distinct to figure this stuff out. Because if I forget the distinct, and I'll show you guys them side by side, it'll show you the 500 because when it counts, it just counts the values, not the unique values. So just remember count distinct. All right. So this gets us this example. Showed you guys how to do an alias. Um, which is actually kind of interesting because uh, the example, some of these examples you see in here, it says no column name here. But when you look at it in MySQL Workbench, you'll actually see this. Um, I'm guessing that these slides were made with an older version of MySQL. Um, this is just showing you that, yeah, you can actually run multiple aggregates at once. Here's the count. Here's the count distinct. Um, all right. So that is the basic usage of aggregates. However, aggregates are significantly more powerful than that once you start grouping. So how many of you have run surveys of some sort? You know, in grade school, you had to do a survey for something or, you know, and you know the worst part of that process, right? Collating the results of your because essentially you need, okay, question one, there was two, there's three possible answers and you need to know how many of each. So what are you doing? You're grouping by question one. You're counting how many responses for question one for each of the possible answers. So you're grouping based on question one, how many different totals there are. You can do the same thing in SQL and get it to do that math for you. Now, if I am going to go back to playing with my order lines. Some total from order lines. This is what I showed you guys earlier. Now, if you remember last week, I talked about how there's a little bit more, there's a few more pieces to the select statement. The next one I'm going to introduce you to is group by. So if this is where, you know, you're taking your results of your survey, you're collating all the results for question one, you're collating all the results for question two, question three. But in this case, I want to know what the total is per order. And I happen to know that in order lines, I've got an order ID. So I'm going to say order by order ID, sum. And now I've got totals per order ID. Not the most useful piece of information because you don't know what order it is, but we could go. And now we know that order one was $609. Um, $1,200, et cetera, et cetera. And we can slap on the order by, because you can order by the aggregate, which is cool. And now we know that order 345 is the biggest order. All I'm doing is slowly building up the SQL statement. You notice I'm not doing just one thing. I'm not trying to write, well, I could write the whole thing on one go, but this is just like when you're writing Java code. You write a little bit of code, you make sure it you compiles, it runs, it does what it's supposed to do, right? Running and doing what it's supposed to do is not the same thing. You add a little more, make sure that's not borked. And you'll notice as I go through today is that's what I'm doing is I'm just building up these queries piece by piece. So now I can group by the order ID. It allowed me to sum the total. Um, there's a few other interesting things in here. Um, let's just say instead of that, I want to go um, so I'm not going to put in any aggregates yet. And I'm going to hit run. 
So right now I am showing two columns of things that might be interesting to see. Um, the column called list. Some of you may recognize these. These are drug names. I just dumped a list of drugs and made up numbers, just like how most drug manufacturers make up numbers. Um, and now let's say I want to know what the average cost is per drug because they didn't necessarily all sell for the same price. So I could ask for the average. And now I am going to show you, did they finally fix this? No. This is MySQL's stupidest, see the giant air quotes, feature. MySQL allows you to do something with an aggregate that no other database server allows you to do. Have a display column, in this case it's the column called list, without forcing you to group by it. Can anybody tell me what that $54.66 actually means? Does it actually have meaning? It has absolutely no meaning. And if we get clever, let me just undo my aggregate, you will notice that Cirquel is the very first value in the table, or the results. What MySQL is doing, it's saying, you want to know what the average is. Oh no, or you want to know what the sum is. I got you, fam. We're just, since you didn't tell me to group it, we're just going to group it by the very first thing we see, and we're just going to make it say that's what the value of this is. It is useless. Um, if you tried to do this in Oracle and Postgres and Microsoft SQL Server, the database server would call you an idiot. Not quite in those words, but it would basically say, hey, you forgot to do this. So I am going to um, put my average back in. Once again, demonstrate how stupid MySQL is. And we are actually going to do this properly, which is we're going to group by the list. And now we got the average for each, the average cost of each drug. So picture that, you know, this is a database where um, drugs are being sold, whatever way they're being sold. And depending who they're selling it to, they're selling them at different prices, which is exactly how, for example, Costco pays less for their prescriptions themselves than, say, PharmaSafe, because PharmaSafe has less purchasing power. Walmart, probably outside of the big pharmacy chains like Shoppers and uh, Rexall, I think Walmart has the lowest cost for their drug purchases because they have so much, so many locations that have pharmacies. They have a lot of uh, bargaining power. Therefore, when they pay for the drug, the list price might be $100 a pill. They might be paying $2 a pill. Whereas pharmacy might be paying $5 a pill. So what this is telling me is saying, on the average, this is how much each of these drugs cost. Which tells us the next thing we might want to do is we might actually want to know what the minimum cost is and the maximum cost. Why does it insist on doing that? And I'm going to run that. Okay. So now we can see that the first drug at the top, Seroquel, on average was 50 Four dollars. I'm rounding up. The minimum cost was twelve fifty eight. The maximum cost was ninety six. Uh, ninety seven bucks. Let's round it to make it easy. This is where aggregates come into their own. It is very useful to summarize this data. Can somebody try to picture how you do this? Exact what I just did in these three lines of text in Java. Think about how many lines of code that might be. Right? I mean, I know in Java to connect to a database, it's th minimum three lines of code. Uh, you have to prepare a statement. So you generate an SQL statement in a string. You prepare it. You execute it. You check if it worked. You start the loop by pulling the first record. And we haven't even started doing math yet. Right? So we're what, at 10 lines of code and we haven't done any math. Whereas for our 10 lines of code, We've already done the math. We could just ask for the first returned record and we already have our numbers. Also, which, which way do you think is going to be done faster? Do you think the database server is going to do the math for you faster or that code that you hand wrote? 
that may have unexpected bugs, features, that randomly do funny things. I can guarantee that the database server will do this math significantly faster than your Java application. I try to avoid, I'm a PHP developer, which means my code is not even compiled, it's interpreted. I do as much heavy lifting for this kind of stuff in the database as I can, because I don't want to have my web server have to do the math if it doesn't have to. If I've got a server in the back doing math for me in the database, in the database engine, that's where you want the math to happen, is in the back, not in the front end, or the, sorry, the app business layer in the middle, because web servers are powerful. The programming languages are powerful, but they're not gonna be as fast as compiled code. And they take up resources. So you've got 15 people asking for this piece of math. You actually got executed 15 times. The database server will see that you asked for this exact number recently, and it's actually gonna pull it out of its cache. It's gonna say, oh, I just saw this query 15 milliseconds ago. I don't even need to ask the, I don't even need to ask the data again. I'll just give them the same results as the last time I saw this. So let the database server do the work for you. All right, so I just showed you guys group by, you can actually group by multiple items. You comma delimit it. Um, so I'm gonna mod switch back to uh, my customer list really quick. So if I go select um, city comma region, actually no, let's go count star, comma city, comma region from customers, group by region, comma city. And I'm gonna throw an order by on there because this is gonna be completely impossible to read if I don't sort it. All right, so here's what it's doing. It's counting each row of data being returned, and then it's basically creating buckets based on the city first, and then the, actually by the region first and then the city. So it's saying, okay, so we counted, it's gonna figure out everybody that's in Alabama, and then it's gonna subdivide that into each of those. So the, again, back to our survey examples, where uh, you had a question that could have, you know, question 8A, question 8B, then you need to collate your results on both of those sets combined. That's what this does is you can summarize and break it down multiple times. Again, I mean, how fast that ran, that ran fast, so fast that it, it actually registered a zero execution time. It's only 500 rows. On a million rows, this would hurt. But on 500 rows, like it, it's literally, it's so fast I can't even get it to come, oh, I actually got it to come up with a number that time. One thousandth of a second. Tenth, one, I'm sorry, a hundredth of a second. So, you know, that's pretty fast. And I bet you most of that was, um, the, that that time is not how long it took the database server to run it, that's how long it took to pull it from the database server. Um, so that's group by. So let's see how many slides I just skipped. Oh, there's, they're actually throwing in the having in here for shits and giggles, we're at it. Okay. Before I continue, I'll cover having. Uh, I'm going to go back to my drug one because that one's way more interesting. Okay, so we're back to our drug one we had a few minutes ago. So I just showed you guys how to group things. So group by different bins. So I want to summarize based on these bins. Am I really that boring? Thank you. Man, you guys are so badly behaved. Rude. So grouping shows you how to break things into separate bins so you can have meaningful data. Having, so having is like a where clause. Where happens before you summarize. Having allows you to filter based on the results of the math. 
So if I could go uh, having the average cost uh, greater than $55. Now it's showing me only drugs that have an average cost greater than $55. The reason why you do having at the end is you cannot filter on an aggregate unless the math has been done. So I've had some people ask me, well, why can't I put do this as a where clause? Okay, so I'm going to take this, comment it out, convert this into a where. And, well, no, I've got an error. That there's something that happened. MySQL is actually doing something proper and it's telling me that I'm doing something wrong. Invalid use of a group function. It doesn't actually tell you what the error message is, but what it actually means. It's saying that you can't use an aggregate in the where clause. Why? Because the aggregate only happens, so the math only happens once it's already figured out what the data is. So the where clause allows you to reduce the how many rows are being returned, then it does the aggregate, and then it does the halving. So you can never use an aggregate in the where clause because it doesn't know what the total is because it hasn't gotten there yet. Um, on the other hand, I could uh, do a piece of math in here like um, list. So I just want to know the drugs that start with S. So this is basically the aggregate part, I'm not going to beat a dead horse on. So I'm retrieving from order lines where any drugs, which is the column called list, starts with S. I group it by the list column because I want it to have meaningful data of some sort. And then I'm saying, but I also want to only know the ones that have a cost over $55. Out of curiosity, do I have any gut filtered by this? The answer is many. So the having part of it allows you to reduce how much data is being retrieved. Again, let's just say you wanted, you didn't, you weren't using the having clause and you decided you were going to write this in Java, but you actually decided to do it, you know, half-ass right. And you decided to use the aggregates and it returns everything else. And then your code needs to figure out where anything that is more than $55 for the average. That's going to be the exact, almost exact same amount of code as if you did all the math yourself. Because you're still going to loop through the whole record. You're going to say, oh, is the average greater than this? Let's display it. Otherwise, skip it over and over and over again. Really, it's not that much less code from doing the math to filtering the results in your whatever language of choice. However, getting the database server to do the work for you that's the magic sauce. Because um, this has two net positives for you. Um, one, you're leveraging code that some really, really smart people wrote that runs really efficiently. That means you don't need to do that work. The less work you have to do, the better it is. And I not, don't mean as because you're all students and you're, all your code sucks. I've been doing this for 27 years. I still try to avoid writing code if I don't have to. Why? Because if you write code, that means you probably created bugs that then you have to fix. You know, right? The more you write, the more likely you're going to introduce something into the mix. That's advantage number one. Advantage number two. Remember last week I, when I talked about trying to shove a lot of data through a really small hole? How much data do you think that is to shove through that hole? I mean, if you think of each of these things as being a single byte, and these are numbers, so they're not even, you know, they don't even take up as much room as letters and characters do. Um, these results might be 700 bytes, maybe a K at the outside. One K won't even be noticed going through the pipe, as opposed to, you know, a megabyte of data or two megabytes of data. Even if you're just retrieving just the minimum number of columns, you're still going to retrieve a lot of data back. This is actually going to be significantly more efficient. Um, and of course, as always, we have a having 
And we can throw in our happy order by order by list. All right now we're sorting alphabetically. Um, believe it or not, that's all there is to aggregates. It looks like a lot, but this example I've got on the screen right now, and I haven't gone through the slides yet. There's 19 slides and I stopped partway through. Let's see. Okay, so this is what I just have on the screen for you guys. Um, all right, so just to go over some of these items, make sure I didn't forget anything important. Um, the where clause specifies which rows will be used to determine the groups and to do the math. Where reduces the number of rows that we're operating against. And the database server is efficient, but it will definitely be more efficient operating against a smaller set of rows than against the entire thing. Makes sense, right? The having clause specifies which groups will be used in the final results. In other words, having says anything that matches this pattern. And I've seen some people get a little special. Students, I think they're being clever. Um, which, what they do is, believe it or not, that will give me the exact same result. However, can somebody tell me why this is stupid? Yeah, no, that, that that's fine. This is not a programming bug. This is a logic bug. You look like you, you want to say something, but you're like smiling. Well, I'm not going to say anything. What is happening right here, for anybody who may have guessed it but just scared to speak, is the list. What's happening is it's literally doing all the math on every row in the table. Then it's saying, give me anything that has a cost over 55, and it starts with S. So you literally operate against every row in the database. And then you're going to say, oh, by the way, only one of the ones that were S. Has anybody here ever had to do work? And then whoever you were doing it for says, I really didn't need all this. I only wanted you to like, you know, staple these three sheets of paper, not photocopy 55,000 copies. This is literally what this is doing is it's photocopying 55,000 copies and then showing you the three that you actually wanted. Yeah. Yes, so well, it consumes memory, consumes processor cycles, it adds uh, data locks, it does a bunch of things, right? So the where clause reduces how many rows it's doing the math against. Again, back to my survey example for those of us that have had to experience it. And those of us of a certain vintage where we couldn't get the computers to do the math for us, when we had to do these surveys, what, I actually had one where we had a stack of surveys. Thank goodness I came from a really small school with only like 380 students. We ran a survey and they wanted the results grouped by, I think it was like question two, but they only wanted the results for those that answered question four as yes. So we had to go through all of them to figure out anybody who answered question four, separate them out. Now imagine if we did the other way around where we had to add it all up and then we found out later that we only wanted question four. That means we'd have to go through the whole pile a second time and redo the math. And that's literally what this is doing. You're just wasting efficiency by being, you know, writing something dumb. Um, just because if you can doesn't mean you should. Um, you know, that's a pretty common saying. So in general, the where is before the group by. Uh, some database servers do not require that placement, but to be safe, always have the where before the group by. Um, out of curiosity, I, I, I know I tried this once and I can't remember what the result was. I think MySQL really hates you if you try to do it like this. So MySQL is a good example where, well, actually it's actually doing it right so that 
the where has always to be has, always has to be before the having, which makes sense when you think of it logically, right? You want to retrieve from order lines where the list is starts with s. Then we're going to do some math. Um, honestly, I can't remember the last time I saw a database server that didn't care the order. Oracle cares. Microsoft SQL Server cares. Postgres definitely cares. Apparently, MySQL cares. That, that was a surprise. Um, I'm pretty sure Teradata cares. So, you know, all the big ones pretty much care. Uh, Sybase, DB2, they all care. Um, so always put the where before the group by. Um, so there's always a bit of ambiguity when statements include both the where and the having. So some people, you know, if they see them in a different order, they just think something weird is happening. Uh, always put them in the right order. So regardless if the SQL server uh, allows you to write the where clause after having, it will always do the where clause first. So it'll read the whole statement figure out that there's a where clause, operate on that, and then it does the having. So regardless, the SQL optimizer, which is what that's called, when the database server receives the piece of string that says this is an SQL command, it reads it and it runs it through something called an optimizer. It tries to figure out the best way to run the command for you. And it will always look at the where clause and will always do it before it does any aggregates. So at least that's good. Um, Grouping more than one column. I already showed you guys that. Okay, so column names must appear in the group by clause. Remember earlier, I, I showed you guys the stupid thing that MySQL lets you do. Let's you do an aggregate and have a display column without actually having the group by clause, which as I said before, is totally pointless information. They could, why even have a display column at that point? A same database server, will return to you an error message. So this error message on here happens to be what Microsoft SQL Server returns. Um, so if you try to do it and you forget to include a column, and I, it happens to me all the time when I'm writing a fresh statement that off the top of my head trying to figure something out, it will tell me, hey, you added a display column, but it's not in the group by, so I can't do this for you. And you know, different database servers will give you a different error message, but it's usually pretty clear. Like it's literally saying, um, this in this case is SKUs invalid in the select list because it's not contained in either an aggregate function or a group by. So it's literally saying, you know, because this is neither being added up or being summarized by, I can't include that. So try again. And this is with the order by which is literally this example I just did for you guys. So this is the kitchen sink version. It has one of everything in it. Um, it has the aggregate, has a display column, it has a where clause, it has a having, it has a, you know, sorting. This is a really good example for your lab eight. Yeah, it's lab eight. Um, Basically, this has everything you need for Lab 8 in one slide, which is good to know. Um, now, there are some limitations. Actually, I'm going to just finish my last little bit for the more you know. Um, as of this slide, you also have 80% of what you need for assignment 2 which once I'm done this, I'll be talking about assignment two. So that's why I'm glad today's a short content lecture. Okay, now there are a few limitations for using this, the functions. Um, you cannot combine table column names with an SQL built-in function um, because, well, it's still complaining about how it's not included in the group by and you can't use it in the where clause. I already showed you guys that because the math happens later. Um, and there's actually one other limitation. And um, let me show you this other limitation. Excuse me, can somebody tell me what this is about to do? 
I bet you it's not going to do what you think it's going to do. But cons Yeah, so let's say I want to know what the average total is. But I want to add it up by by the uh, by the uh, list actually not by line by list. So by list. So I want to know what the average total is for each of the drugs. And the human brain saying, I understand what this is asking. Invalid use of group function. That seems familiar, doesn't it? You cannot aggregate an aggregate. Because the aggregate operates on the returning results of the initial query. And then it does the math. And then it's done doing math. And suddenly you tell it, oh, I want you to do some more math. It's saying, no, I've already done the math. So you cannot aggregate an aggregate. There is a way to do it, but you'll have to wait for next week for that one um, because it has something to do with next, week, next week's topic. You cannot aggregate an aggregate. It is functionally impossible. I've never seen a single database server that will do it. It's because the human brain is very good at extrapolating the concept of what we're after. Like, you know, our brains are kind of fuzzy, right? We can say, oh, that's kind of weird, but I think I know what they want. So, you know, I can figure this out. The computer's like, nah, I can't do that. That's not how, that's not how it works. So it's saying, no, you're not allowed to do this. Um, so that's a limitation of that. And if I wanted to do that math where you know the order total is greater than the average order total i still can't do that math um because in this case what's happening this has nothing to do with aggregate functions i forgot that they slapped the slide right in at the end so what this is doing is it's doing a uh, mathematic expression it's saying hey uh, quantity times price give me anything that's not equal to the extended price so that you can do, because you notice there's not a single aggregate function in that. So that's the kind of math you can do. So if I turned around here and I go select star from order lines, where um, cost times quantity, and I'm going to put it in parentheses just because I want to make sure um, is not equal to total, it's still returning nothing because right now my cost time quantity is still the same. Um, less than total? Greater than total? That's because right now it all adds up. Just like that slide says, you know, because it's supposed to add up. So it does. Uh, if I were to muck with my database and change some of the totals, that would suddenly start working. Um, for example, I can prove it by going cost times quantity, comma, total. And it helps if I take that where clause off. So this is just verifying that the numbers are the same. Um, usually I, at this point, I occasionally have a student say, well, why would you even want to run a query like that? It's a sanity check. Oh, they are equal, but what I did is not equal. Exactly. So you want to make sure that the the each row of data is valid. So this is what you'd use this kind of query for: is you'd run it with the you know not equal to total to pull out where if there's any data errors. It doesn't happen very often, but there's the odd time where something weird happens to the code and invalid values get shoved into the database, and then you end up needing to do some sanity checking, and that's what that's for. Um, that's just what that's handy for. Um, I showed you guys concat already, um, so I don't even need to show you that. Okay, so that is aggregate functions. Uh, the examples I did today show you everything you need for Lab 8. There's nothing weird or complicated in Lab 8. For those of you that have started Lab 7, Lab 8 is just more of the same. I'm just asking you to do a little more than what Seven asked you to do. It's slowly building up your skill set. And now I'm going to talk about everybody's favorite topic.
Diamond two. Um, so historically, and it should be on here. I just want to make sure I'm not lying. Uh, if I click on the assignment, no. Oh, I hate that. Sometimes browsing Brightspace as a prof is really painful. Because sometimes I click on things and it just makes me want to edit it. Um, excellent. It's there. You'll notice there's a single diagram. So assignment two originally was as follows. Take the diagram you created in assignment one. And now I want you to actually physically make the database. It was a really cool concept that we came up with so that, you know, your work flowed through the entire term. It last that concept lasted for me one semester. Uh, how many of you would like to try to build the database you got graded on and populate it with data? I decided no. Uh, considering what I saw, it was not a good idea. So assignment two is pure SQL. What your so in here you will find a diagram. Looks like this. It's not a super big diagram. It's not a super complicated diagram. It kind of looks like lab six, doesn't it? Just more, because it's an assignment. So it should be a little more than a lab. Take this database it's a diagram. You'll notice it's a PNG, not a workbench file. I made that mistake once, about six years ago. You can imagine what most of the students went and did, right? They're like, yeah, just forward engineer, save file. Half the assignment's done. Kind of have a beer. <laughs> right? So, again, you can form groups of two or three. You can use the same groups. You can get new group members. As you can see, the student body count has gone down a little bit since the break. That's normal. Some people just discover at the break that they're done, which is cool. I am not judging. No, really, I'm not, because for some people, they really realize this is not for them. And you will form a group if possible. You will submit four files. They're all text files. So you know how you've been saving lab six, lab seven as a .txt? That's how you're gonna submit them to Brightspace because Brightspace hates .sql files. It'll let you put them in, but I can't view them without downloading them. It's a big pain. And then the diagram you've been provided, there is four pieces, four tasks. There is the DDL command. So the first file is a DDL command file, and this file, you will it will create the physical structure of the database. In in MySQL, so you run it. It should create the tables with the foreign keys. It has to be the same. You don't get to be creative with the column names. You don't get to go mixed case. It has to be exactly like the diagram. As I was telling students in a lab section, that's not for you guys. A lot of them, they decide, well, you know, the previous prof, that was their naming convention, so they decide to redo my diagram and then do lab six. I'm like, if you had done that and I was your boss, I'd be reaming you out. Because if the database designer gives you a diagram, they expect you to follow the diagram. They don't want the person that's been working for three months getting cute and creative. Follow the diagram. You will have a comment block at the top. It has the file name in it. It has the authors, in other words, the group members, a short description of what this file is. I mean, you guys are starting to get the feel for Java, where you know you have a comment block at the top of your file and it says, this is who I am, this is the assignment of the lab, and blah, blah, blah. Same idea. And then you will have the commands that create the tables and the constraints, including primary keys and foreign keys. It has 17 points. Two points for the comment block. I'm literally giving you two points for putting down your name. Can you guys guess why I've gotten to the point where I give you guys points for putting down your name? Because I've had people submit files and I don't know whose assignments it is. 
So in the end, I end up with, you know, three or four students that have no assignment tied to them, but I've got two assignments. I'm like, everybody gets a zero. And points for the commands. So the way this works is I'm not going to go through line by line and say, oh, this one's right, this one's right. I am going to skim it, make sure you're following the naming conventions right. And I take points off for every error message I see. Just like in your Java class, you would not submit an assignment or a lab to your Java prof if it doesn't compile. If it does not run, it's not fit for submission. Okay, and then there's test data. Um, I'm going to show you guys some a really cool tool in a minute to help you with the test data because test data really sucks. Um, you will be given points for the test data. Again, it's a single file. All the insert statements are going to be in it. You'll notice there's a comment block at the top. Guess how many points you get for that? Two more points. Congrats. And then 10 points for the functional insert statements, five points for data coverage. In other words, did you populate everything that was important in the database? There are certain queries I'm going to get you guys to run. And therefore, if you don't have the data to run those queries, it's not going to be very good. Again, if you don't do good data coverage, you're going to lose points. Error messages, you lose points. Queries, 11 queries. This sounds a lot like lab seven, eight, and well, nine. You will supply a file with a comment block worth two points. This is starting to get redundant, but right now you've got six points for free. And 11 queries. And the way the math is working on those queries is as follows, is three points for each query. So this whole chunk is worth 33 points. And did you submit a query? Does it run? Does it do what I'm asking for? Those are the three points. So it is now I will be completely honest with the did you submit a query? Is did you submit a query that's trying to answer the question? Like if you give me 11 select star from customers, you're going to get one point, right? At least the, 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 did you give me a query is, did you try it? Um, and then, you know, does it run? Does it do what it's actually being asked? And they're not particularly complicated. A simple query that pulls all columns and rows from a table. Notice I'm not naming a specific table. Different groups can grab data from different tables. It gives me a bit of variety. And when I feed this into the cheat compare code, there is a, you know how there's a turn it in to make sure assignment like la like, like written assignments are not plagiarized. There's something that double checks all the submissions of a group to see how many of them, how close they are to each other. So if I get two groups of the 99% match, I'm like, one group did the work, one group copied. Both groups get nailed for academic dishonesty, which is where two things happens, right? The test data should be unique to the group. Mostly these queries are gonna be pretty much unique to the group. The DDL should be pretty much identical between each group because, you know, it's not exactly the same, but it should be pretty close. And then at the end, you'll also create two views. We'll be talking about views in two weeks, which is fine because it's the very last piece of the assignment. It, I'm probably going to cover it, depending how much time there's left, I will actually do a quick summary of views at the end of next week. It just depends how long next week takes. Um, Now, in the queries, there are some complex queries that you are not ready for yet. There's uh, query number five, query number six, um, 10 and 11 you're not ready for, but the rest of them you should be able to do. Um, those ones I numbered off will have, need next week's lecture. Or in theory, if you're really good, you could ask Chad GPT how to do it. It'll show you how to do it and it'll give you a really good example too. I'm just I'm not saying it's a bad way to learn. I'm just you know, but you'll notice that none of these actually specify specific table. None of these specify specific columns. It allows each group to be unique with your submissions while working with the same database structure. And the last one, like I said, is two views. You're going to create two views as follows. Again, two points for that comment block. 
And then you get one point for submitting command to create the view, one point that it actually works. So out of a total of um, 75 points, you get eight points for free just for your comments. So that's as generous as I can be with giving away free points. <laughs> As you will notice, this la this assignment is slightly different from the first one, where as long as you follow the checklist, you're pretty much guaranteed a good grade. This one is you actually got to make it work, so because it's mechanical, it's not conceptual; it's a mechanical task. Okay, now for the test data, um, I use there's a website called GenerateData.com, and GeneratData.com is really, really cool. You will notice that I did a few things. So you go to GeneratData.com, you click on the generator link, and over on the right, or it could be at the bottom, it'll show you a preview of the results of what's about to happen. And you set SQL, you say it's MySQL, you can name the table you're planning to insert into, for example, customers. Um, you don't want to include the drop or the create table because I want you guys to write those yourselves, but it won't even create all the, the foreign keys for you. So you're still stuck writing most of this yourself. Um, I don't care if you include the back ticks or not. Don't include the auto increment because for this assignment, you should assume that all the ID columns are auto increment. Just saying. Okay. And I'm going to close this panel. So what's cool about this particular tool is you can tell it to generate different kinds of data. So this one's saying names. And I'm going to go, I want this to be names. And we have a choice. The guy updated his site again. Seriously? Um, you have a way to, this used to be a drop down. This is kind of weird. Press enter to create item. I hate it when people change their websites and they're trying to show somebody else how to use it. Name search. Just do name. That's working. Um, I'm guessing there's probably a help file somewhere and I will point you guys out to it. Uh, this used to be just a drop down. So um, we can do. Street address, which is cool. We can do, here's where things get really cool. We can go region. And I'm going to add a row for country. And I can say for this region, I can base it on my country's row. So what it's going to do is actually going to create provinces and states for your data that match whatever country. So the data looks really real. And it's really good for testing your database, right? If you're following that. Um, and you can also go in the countries, you can choose specific countries. So I could say, I just want Canada, uh, United States and the United Kingdom. So now it's going to uh, tune it to that. And it's uh, not working at all. Wow, the guy really broke his site. Nice. And then you can also add, I'm like, I'm not going to care if your data is real or not. So don't worry about that. But it's a good way to, if you want to do phone numbers, you can add phone numbers. You can add email addresses, which is, this one actually has a cool thing. Um, you can base it on the person's name. So then it'll generate emails based on the people's name. So Craig at Craig.aol.com. Uh, that's kind of cool. Um, they got a few other things in here. You know, you can do dates, uh, postal codes. And again, you can say match the country, the region row. So then it'll generate postal codes based on specific regions. Uh, if it was working right today, but it's not. Um, other ones that you'll see in here that are kind of cool. Um, you can do a list. 
which suddenly you will see that you can create a list with drug names, um, that kind of thing. And the other one that's really cool is credit cards. Now I'll get rid of some of this stuff so you can see it. Look, you can see credit card numbers. And the best part, it actually matches the format for each of the cards. So if it's a Visa, it'll start with a four. If it's a MasterCard, it'll start with a five. It'll actually follow the format properly. Um, then we can add a, another credit card, which is the CVV. So suddenly we got real looking credit card numbers just for shits and giggles. Um, I'm actually, I'm really surprised the guy made this change to this on how this is formatted because you used to be able to do all kinds of nifty things with the field formatting. So I'll have to, I'll take a quick look and see what he changed and I'll let you guys know. But realistically with this, you can still do a pretty good job generating the rough data. Um, and then, it, you know, if you really wanted to create expiry dates, you could go, um, Uh, I want this to be, it's going to be a date. Uh, that's just the column name, and I want to give it the uh, year. And now suddenly I've got a full credit card number for you. You know, credit card, CVV, expiry date, credit card. Um, so you can see how you could use a tool like this to generate a lot of data really fast. Um, I actually use the down, the, this tool is open source so that you can technically download it and install it on your computer. Uh, if you want to take the time to set up a web server and all that stuff to go with it. I use an old version of his site, which is um, not so fancy looking, but I hacked. Um, sorry, I modified it so that I can generate more than 100 rows of data at a time. Mine generates 100,000 rows of data at a time. Um, the joy of having a computer has, you know, 32 gigs of RAM. It really doesn't care. So one question that people I'll, I get from this, they go, well, this is cool. You can generate the customer information. You can generate this. And how would you generate a foreign key? You're like, how do you generate a foreign key? I'm like, well, that's kind of, we can generate a foreign key with this. As long as you've generated the data appropriately first. So if you know for a fact that you inserted 100 customers and ID goes from one to 100, if I wanted to, let's just say I wanted to store the credit cards for a customer, I could go um, number range between one and 100, and I'd call this, and now I got a foreign key based on that range of values that I know are valid in my database. So as you're doing your assignment, you're gonna populate the customer information, for example. You'll do a select star to make sure the data is good. You'll see the IDs run from one to 100, one, 1,000, whatever. And then you can just feed it something like this to generate related data fairly easily. So, but to be able to do this, you still need to understand what order the data goes in, right? You need to know that you populate the customer before you populate an order, then before you create the order, before you create the order lines, because that's the order of the relationships you have to populate in that same order. Which leads me to the very last item you guys need for the assignment. Some of you have seen this for lab six. See those three lines? Those should be the very first three lines of your DDL file, not at the top of every file, because that's going to be bad. Imagine you got your first file runs through, you create your database structure, then you're going to go, no, I'm, I'm going to insert some data and I nuke the tables. No, no, this should be like basically the first three lines of your DDL file. Um, just so I can explain for you guys that don't have me in lab, and I covered this in my lab a little bit. So drop database, if exists, what that's doing is saying, I want you to delete this database if it exists. If it doesn't exist, don't delete it because it doesn't exist, but at least it's not going to generate you an error. Because normally if you go drop database assignment two, 
Actually, let me try it right now because I don't think I've got an assignment two database in here at the moment. If I try to run this, and I'll drop assignment two, database doesn't exist. So if I bring that back and I run it, it created it. But you'll notice instead of giving you an error message, it gave me a warning saying, hey, I tried to delete something that does not exist. Cool. I still, you know, it's all good. And then um, now I'm going to create it. It created the database. Now it's connecting. What this will do is it guarantees that your primary keys are always going to be the same. Right? If everything is auto increment, every single time you purge the entire set of tables, recreate the database, rerun your creation script, you are guaranteeing that whatever you submit to me will be exactly like how it is on your machine. Which leads me to the demo. Of course, we have to demo. Last week of class in lab, you will quote unquote demo. How was how is the demo going to work this time? One group member will come up with their laptop. They will have all four files loaded and ready to go. Or I don't care how they're loaded, ready to go. Four notepad documents, I couldn't give two shits. Whatever way works best for you. And then you will take each of those files and run them in sequence. You will create the tables, insert the data, run the queries, create the views, and prove to me the views work. On average, this demo takes one minute, 35 seconds. Five minutes at most. Technical difficulties. Uh, usually when it takes more than five minutes, that usually means that whoever it is that's running those commands has no idea what they're doing. Or they came up unprepared. So this is my way of saying, whoever's going to come up with their laptop, the whole group's going to show up. So everybody gets to be horrified at the same time if things go horribly wrong. Shouldn't just put it all on one person. Whoever's coming up with their laptop and it should be whoever's laptop works the best. Because, you know, there'll be the odd time where somebody's got a laptop from the Jurassic period. Hey, he's this guy laughed out loud. I go, last semester I had a student show up with a, a Core 2 Duo with two gigabytes of RAM. Running Windows Vista. And they were using that for their course. That lasted not very long. But I'm just saying, like, people, there's always somebody, or somebody's got a laptop, that just it's just weird, it's just slow. It doesn't have to be a Windows laptop. If it's a Mac laptop, that's fine. As long as you can run all four files, you will come up, run them. It works, or it does not. I mark you as it, it's done. You pack up your shit, and you leave. I will put a marker at the front of the class. It's going to be a bloodbath on who gets to go first. And you're going to just write down your names on the board. Whoever's first gets to go first. It doesn't take very long. Realistically, uh, last semester, I was done my demos in 37 minutes. So, and there was a technical difficulty where somebody's laptop blue screen halfway through their demo. And that took the longest amount of time as they had to go get another group member's laptop that had all the files and they were ready to roll anyway. So apparently that blue screen was not a mystery. So that is it for today. You'll notice today's lecture was nice and short. Uh, next week's lecture will be a little longer, but much more painful. Uh, next week's topic is joins and joins and subqueries. For some people, it's like it clicks right away, and some people, they just cry. Um, but it's good. It's only worth like uh, four items on the whole assignment. So it's not that bad. All right. Uh, outside of that, let's let you guys go. Um, I'll see you guys in the